Please pray with me. Gracious God, help us with the things that we do and say that can't be erased. Help us to listen more and speak less and love as you intend. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, that we could erase some things. Well, I'm going to guess around two. That's how old I think the child was that Jesus took into his arms. Two. We're not told the age of the child, so we get to guess. So two is my guess. Two-year-olds can be a real package. At the same time, they're still babies and very vulnerable. In two straight chapters in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus takes a little child into his arms and teaches his disciples a lesson. He was driving home a point. On this particular day, Jesus was once again trying to teach them about what he was going to do and what the kingdom of God is really like. He told them that he would be betrayed, arrested, killed, and on the third day rise again. And this did not fit with their definition of the Messiah. It's not how God works. How difficult it is to submit to how God works. We know better. The disciples weren't getting it. The gospel writer shows us this by telling us that they were afraid to ask Jesus questions. That's a real picture. They were afraid to ask Jesus questions. And then Mark shows us how really difficult it was for them. When they get to home base in Capernaum, Jesus asks them, what were you arguing about on the way? And they didn't answer him. They didn't ask him questions, and now they're not answering his questions. So we're privy to a very uncomfortable scene. He asks them, and they don't answer. Well, we are told what the answer really was. They were arguing about who was the greatest. Today, when we encounter somebody who isn't getting it, we kind of knock our fist to our head and look at them and say, don't you get it? And I don't know what kind of face Jesus was wearing when they didn't get it, or if he groaned, or if he tapped his head. We do know he sat down, and that's the teaching position. The disciples knew, uh-oh, he's sitting now. We're going to get a learning. And so he did. And he tells them, whoever wants to be first must be the last of all and servant of all. They didn't want to hear that. Neither do we. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. This is your goal. Then he took a little child. Can you picture how this is taking place? They're in a home. Children, obviously, were running around. I bet once in a while they made a little noise. Not one story about Jesus shutting them up. Anyway, he takes the child in his arms and says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. It just gets more and more difficult. And what is it with these children? In the very next chapter, people are bringing children to Jesus for him to touch them. And the disciples give them a hard time. This is occurring right after Jesus teaches about marriage and the importance of taking care of the vulnerable. The implication is that uh, the important teacher does not have time for babies. And Jesus, with a baby in his arm, tells them that they can't get into the kingdom of God unless they do it like that baby. What is it with these children? Well, you don't get to picture it from my angle, but I think you can get it. They are vulnerable. They are powerless. In fact, in Jesus' time, they were invisible. 
And I don't know how it is with people a lot younger than me today, but when I was a kid, we were taught that children should be seen and not heard. They definitely shouldn't interrupt adult men who were talking about important things. In most ancient literature, babies weren't even mentioned. When a child is almost an adult, then they're getting to be important. If you want to follow me, give up your power. There, I said it. Identify yourself with the marginal. Don't be thinking about being great, and for goodness sakes, don't argue about it with each other. When I was writing this, I was remembering a boxer from the 60s and 70s, a heavyweight, very famous and popular. He was not noted for shouting for everyone to hear, I am the greatest. That works on popular culture. In one of my favorite songs about Jesus, the singer says, he's still my favorite loser, falling for the entire human race. What a contrast. Instead of a larger than life sports figure, a better icon is a diminutive nun working with the poorest of the poor in Calcutta. Maybe she was the greatest. I'll confess, I was looking at Facebook and a friend of mine from way back was visiting her parents in Germany. They've been married over 70 years. And she shared a couple pictures from a grocery store in Germany. One was a picture of a sign in German that I can't read. And the other was empty shelves in the grocery store. And the sign above the empty shelves was an apology to the grocery store's customers. They didn't have any food because they gave it to the refugees going by in buses. Maybe they're the greatest. Maybe they're the greatest. This life Jesus calls us to was backwards for his disciples and it is backwards for us too. We like the beautiful, the strong, the smart, the powerful, the rich. And we want to be all those things. Jesus tells us to look for the outsider, the powerless, the vulnerable, the children. And in some strange way, we need to be like them. Today's lessons challenge us to choose and act. And they're all very either or. Either or. They're not very Anglican passages today, which would allow us both and. We don't get that. It's either or. Over and over again in the Bible, we read about how people of the kingdom of God are supposed to act. And James today gives us an illustration when he teaches the church about wisdom. He says, if you are truly wise, if you are a kingdom person, show it by your good life, show your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. Gentleness born of wisdom. Don't be, either or, envious, angry, selfishly ambitious. The word there is, is kind of a, a zealousness. There are two kinds of wisdom, he says. One is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish. It's so zealous about its outcome that others are hurt. It is not surprising that some Christians see the Jesus walk as being like the greatest boxer. There's no room for second best. The other wisdom, it comes from above. Here's what it's like. You are pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, 
Peaceful without partiality. It values babies. It values babies no matter how old they are, even if they are older than you. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to be willing to yield. I think that's where we say no thank you to God. Sounds nice, God, but no thank you. Other stuff you're right about, but on this one you're wrong. Don't we do that when we're really honest? Willing to yield. As I wrote it, I pictured the, the yellow road sign, you know, the triangle, where I would let somebody else go before me. Man, I grew up driving in Chicago. We don't yield. If you don't go, you lose. And I'll confess. I'm really bad in a grocery store. It was hard for me to use the grocery store illustration because this, it comes back and haunts me here. Because I'm not a patient person in the grocery store. I don't like to yield. Get out of my way. I got things to do. And mine are important. Willingness to yield. My important for your important. We allow others the right of way. It surrenders being right. It gives up being first. And it is exactly what Jesus did for you and me. Exactly. He gave up power and became a human being. He yielded to us. And now he's saying to his people, this is how I want you to be. This is what the kingdom of God is like. And when we do, it does this strange thing. It's a thing we don't like to do at St. Thomas symbolically, but still, we get to stand in the presence of God. We prefer to kneel. That's okay too. But we get to stand in the presence of God. And I know that all of you have had times in your life where you've really seen the things that you've done wrong and all you can feel like doing is putting yourself on your face. As we walk this kingdom walk, God invites us to stand in giving ourselves up, giving ourselves away. We stand before God. That's a really good thing. That is good news. We can get off our faces and stand in the presence of God Almighty. Amen.